My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the unsolved Colonial Parkway murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Kristen Dilley. And I'm Bill Thomas. And we've reached a milestone here at Mind Over Murder. We have reached our 100th episode. How in the world did that happen? I don't know. (laughs) We do about an episode a week, and we've been at this apparently for at least 100 weeks. Yeah, I mean, we started uh, January of 2020, possibly. <laughs> it's We lose track of time because of this pandemic. I know that we were still in early days when the pandemic happened. I guess that was January 2020. I guess so. <laughs> it, it's weird. Like, it, I don't know if it feels like time has just sort of collapsed in on itself for everybody else, but it Everything feels really odd. But yeah, I I think we've been at this about a year. No, almost two years, my dear. Almost two years. Yeah, I guess. Wow, we are reaching the end of it. Because remember, I traveled to Virginia and we recorded the first couple of episodes of Mind Over Murder at your kitchen table face to face. That's right. That's right. And that is coming up on two years ago. And then we launched in January 2020. Right. Okay. I got it. Time flies when you're having fun and recording podcasts. Yes, it does. And we would like to give a very sincere, most heartfelt thank you to every single person out there who has listened, written reviews, supported us. We could not do this without you. We thank you all so much for keeping us afloat through 100 episodes and giving us your feedback and your support. We really, truly appreciate it. We have also passed another significant milestone. We have just passed 400,000 downloads or listens, as they say. It's freaking me out too. (laughs) (laughs) What, that 400,000 times people have listened to you? Yeah, that's freaking me out. Stop that. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. I don't like that. Wait, 100 is a number you can manage, but 400,000 is not a number you care to dwell on. Well, a hundred episodes of something I, you know, put my talent, actually, I don't know if you could say talent, something that I put my effort into (laughs) is one thing. You you could say talent. I I still don't know about that. I don't think I'm ready to own that yet. But um, yeah, 400,000 listens is, is, that's a bigger number I think that I'd care to deal with right now. (laughs) People have been listening to you hundreds of thousands of times. You're freaking me out. (laughs) (laughs) It's so good to know that I've got something, some small degree of leverage. I can just, you know, throw that in there. (laughs) 400,000. At some point, we hope with a little bit of luck and the support of all of you wonderful people, I'll be able to say half a million. Yeah, that's going to be the day that I really (laughs) freak out a little bit. Half a million. Really, honestly, and truly, we owe everybody out there a great debt. And that goes for everyone who has ever guested on our pod. Too many people to mention, although we did our best on our individual pages. Everybody who has written a review, please continue to do so. Bought merchandise to support us, please continue to do that as well. And everybody who has, you know, offered financial contributions or support to the podcast in any way, we really could not be doing this without you. And we do thank you very sincerely from the bottom of our hearts. And don't forget to tell your friends that recommendation. Hey, I listened to this podcast with Kristen Dilley and Bill Thomas. They talk about true crime and the experts behind moving forward on solving unsolved cases. That means the world to us. And that person-to-person recommendation is something that is incredibly valuable and we very much appreciate it. So encouraging your friends to give us a listen and see if they enjoy the podcast as much as you do is very important and meaningful for us. Yeah, thank you. Our episode today, our 100th episode is 
It's a very emotional one for both of us. I definitely ended up in tears and you may hear Bill chastising me a little bit for it. Um, <laughs> well, I think all three of us teared up at different points. We did. Yeah, uh, we are. We are talking to Jenny Minerick, who is Becky Dowski's sister-in-law and her compassion and her warmth and her sensitivity and her sincere love for Becky really comes through. It was very hard at times for all of us to talk about it. So this is a very meaningful 100th episode for us, and we hope that it's meaningful and touching for all of you as well. A new suspect, person of interest, who I don't think has received a lot of coverage in the media coverage of the Colonial Parkway murders over 35 years, comes up and we have a pretty in-depth discussion about this individual. Well, thank you all so much for listening to this episode of Mind Over Murder. We hope you enjoy, and we hope you stick around for the next 100 episodes. We're joined today by Jenny Minerick, who is here to talk to us about Becky Dowski. Jenny, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. I suppose by way of explanation, we should explain that Becky was your sister-in-law. Yes. And, and is someone that you were extremely fond of. We've talked about Becky a number of times. I, I think your great warmth and affection for her comes through, even though you weren't born as sisters and were sisters-in-law. Definitely. My first impression when anyone asked me about Becky is meeting her for the first time. And this 10-year-old, I think, young lady coming to the camp that her, her brother, who is my husband, and I were working at big brown eyes, huge smile, wide-eyed wonder. And I thought, oh my gosh, what a sweetheart. So what are some of the adjectives that you would use to describe Becky? Loving, bright, beautiful, a personality that, that attracted other people, warmth, friendliness, caring for others. I mean, she worked a in youth summer camps and so forth. So she was that counselor. She was a babysitter. I mean, she just had that warmth that attracted people. This experience with working with kids was something that I've heard quite a bit about. Did she work with kids throughout her life? Part of it, you know, I have first knowledge of just in terms of the way she would interact with her nieces and nephews with, you know, my children, when they, when they came along, her ability to, you know, to sit on the floor and, and just connect at their level. I had heard after the fact, you know, that she would babysit for professors at college. And she, that, that's a gift. <laughs> and she possessed that ability to, to connect with them. And she loved it. That's a gift. She worked at a YMCA camp, you know, during the summer with, with youth and had a, apparently a, an amazing connection, you know, with, with the campers that, that attended. It didn't surprise me that people, you know, said that she was an amazing young woman because she was. If you had to pick out a best memory or, or one of the best memories that you have with Becky, what would you say one of them probably is? Wow. I think when her, her brother and I, Bob, visited in Paris when her father had an overseas assignment there, and she was in high school. And the Becky that I knew when I met her, you know, was this, this young girl with an engaging smile, but still very young and wanting to be the pleaser. The young woman that I met in Paris was more mature, attended the you know, American school in, in Paris and very gifted in, in softball and played internationally. And you're just, holy smokes, you know, that, that she had this amazing opportunity. But I think the thing that stands out the most was having Becky show us around and she's just blabbering away in, in French. And you're like, whoa. <laughs> That's impressive. <laughs> grow anymore. This is is someone who has grown and adapted. How old would you say she was at that time? Um, fifteen, sixteen. I know that they had returned to the states 
maybe it was at age 17 and, and that's when she got her driver's license. So it has to be the 15, 16 age. But she was mature beyond her years. I mean, she just was one of those people that, you know, kind of an old soul and just uh, an amazing young woman, truly. It's impressive that this 15 or 16 year old girl would be fluent in English and French and was self-confident enough to kind of act as your tour guide for Bob, her older brother, and you, his wife. It really sounds like even during those six years, those first six or so years that you knew her, that she grew up tremendously. Mm -hmm. That she did. She sounds very self-possessed and confident. Yes. Yeah. She definitely was confident. And, you know, she had a vision of, I, I think, having had that international experience in France prepared her for college, you know, as, as best anyone can be, pre- be prepared in, in going to college and knowing what you wanted to do. And then transferring to, to William and Mary with a clear vision of she wanted to study business. And that's where she and Bob connected because that was his, his forte and, and had, had gotten his master's in that. So there was a real connection there. And we were definitely looking forward to exploring her career possibilities after graduation. And sadly, that never occurred. Do you know what she ultimately wanted to do? I mean, you, there's such a wide array of things you can do with an interest in business. Did she ever tell you what she wanted to do ultimately? As I recall, it, it was, uh, you know, kind of a financial analyst, which is what, okay. you know, Bob was doing. And um, we were excited to, you know, we were supposed to connect that Thanksgiving, we thought, and, um, you know, chat about that. We were supposed to go to Florida and be at my cousin's. And we're so looking forward to that. You know, we knew her as a teenager. And then there was that gap, the college years. And then suddenly to have that connection over the last, you know, probably three months, one, one or two interactions, but it was like, oh my goodness, we cannot wait to get to know her as an adult. Tell us a little bit more about the college trajectory for Becky that, that you know. She started at Dickinson College in Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. and that was a four-year program if I understand it correctly. Right but she decided she was going to leave at the two-year mark and transfer to William and Mary. What were the drivers for that? I think that William and Mary offered more of the business school opportunity that she was looking toward. Other, you know, other than that, I'm not clear on, you know, what her thought process was. Dickinson was a great place to begin, but I think she saw that, what she wanted to do and pursue, William and Mary had what she needed. I was wondering if she might have gone on to get an MBA with this interest in business. And obviously in the 80s, going on to get the MBA and work in business was pretty hot at the time. Yeah, yeah. I have, I have no doubt. I have no doubt. And I know that she spoke with Bob on numerous occasions about you know, what his thoughts were what her career goals were at that time you know and as a junior senior in college you know it's, it's just a very raw and, and you know what do I want to do when I grow up well, this is what I think and this is going to be your you know your best opportunity but she clearly had a, a love for it and loved being at William and Mary And that's really rare to find that, you know, single-minded pursuit of something that you know you want to do so early. I mean, Mm -hmm. there are plenty of people who graduate from college and they still don't know what they want to do. Mm -hmm. So that's really commendable on her part. At this point, you had not heard about Becky entering into a relationship with Kathy Thomas. That wasn't on the family's radar. Not at all. Not at all. Certainly not, you know, for... For Bob and I, I think it was, his, I don't know, you know, for, for Bob's mom, but for us to have learned that piece was, was a shock, total shock. It's funny, you mentioned Thanksgiving, and I don't know what traveling 
Kathy and Becky would have done at Thanksgiving. Kathy was out to our family, so we knew that she had been involved with a a shipmate previously, and then after that breakup, had started dating Becky in the spring of 1986. So we'd heard a lot about Becky, but we had not yet met her. And we were hoping to meet Becky with Kathy, perhaps at Thanksgiving, or, you know, that easily could have stretched to Christmas. The idea, anyway, was that we were going to meet her at some family slash holiday event that fall or maybe into Christmas time. It's very hard to figure out now in retrospect. I think they would have had to have come out to the Dowski family as well. I honestly, I have no idea. I, I, my, my gut feeling is that you know, Julie, the older sister, who, you know, has clearly stated, I mean, after Becky went off to college, they really were not close. And I don't know for Karen and, and Peter, uh, Bob's mom, I don't know. I, Bob's dad, I, I think he had no idea. So, you know, if she shared something with her mom, mom never shared that with us. Was she close with her mother? Jacqueline? Absolutely. They were very close. Yep. They always say that the mothers know. I don't know that that's really true, but... She may have. She may have, but she did not share that with us. But Bob's mom never got over it. Never. You mean the loss? The loss. Yeah. The same with my mother as well. I've said in other interviews that my mom lost her youngest child, her only daughter, and her best friend all in, mm-hmm. in one terrible evening. And it sounds like Becky had a very close relationship with her mom. She did. She did indeed. This is always the question I, I hate to ask because I feel like this starts to dredge up the really bad things. But can you talk us through where you were when you heard what had happened to Becky? I'll never forget. Uh, we were living... And I'm going to choke up on this. Okay. We were living um, in Georgia at the time. Bob had just graduated from grad school. This was his first job. Um, I worked in the emergency department at, at one of the local hospitals part-time. And I was just coming back from Toys R Us, climbing up the stairs of, of this home that we had, came inside, put things down, the phone rang, And it was Bob's sister, Julie. And, you know, she said, Jenny, are you, is Bob there? And of course he was at work. Are you okay? I said, yeah. And she said, I have some very difficult news to tell you. And she shared with me um, that Becky had been found in a car and that she, and I thought, oh, it's, it's an accident. No, and she was dead. And I remember literally sliding down the wall. Because at that time, you know, you had the, the phone that was on the wall yeah. and you picked it up and I, you know, I slid down the wall and um, just shocked, overwhelmed, um, just, just couldn't believe it. And um, fear, amazing fear. You know, if someone would do this to Becky, what, why? Why? Yeah. You know, was something going to, was this, you know, that, that safety net that encircled your family, you know, did that mean that you you all were next. I mean, it, that makes no sense, but you know, that's, that's how I felt. And you were a young mother at the time. Yeah. As well. I, uh, Jen was, my daughter was um, six and, and my son was three. So I can understand the kind of protective exactly. parental thought that yeah. crossed your mind. Do you know how Julie had found out that her sister Becky had been murdered? The, apparently the FBI had tried to contact mom who was at a conference um, in, the, in, the, in the country and, and really, you know, cell or, or phone service was a bit shaky uh, so that it, it was not a great communication. So they reached out to Julie, who was, who was the next eldest, and they shared the information with her. So she then shared it with, with the siblings. And where was Julie living at that time? 
She was in Hyde Park, New York. Which is not too far from where the family yeah, is from. from Poughkeepsie, no. Right. Mm-hmm. So when you learned that the FBI was responsible for taking charge of the investigation, were you hopeful they'd be able to solve the case? I and mean, was this something that was like reassuring? It shocked us initially, you know, why were they involved? And I mean, Bob obviously came home as fast as he could from, from his job, uh, was on the phone immediately with uh, the number that we'd been given. And they shared with him that the FBI was involved because the car had been found on federal property. So he contacted the various, whoever was in charge, whoever he needed to connect to. We, at the time, felt, oh, goodness, that's great. The FBI's involved. Going to get solved. It, they're going to you know, jump on this. And he got on the first plane that he could and went to, to Virginia. It sounds like Bob, as the oldest brother and my older brother, Richard, kind of served a similar mm-hmm. function. I also remind people when we're talking about this, this is 1986. This is before the internet. This is before cell phones. And if you wanted to reach someone, you could call them on a landline only. And typically you'd call them at home or at work. And when someone traveled as Mrs. Dowski was traveling at that time to go to this conference, it could be very difficult to reach people. I know if you're lucky, some people had answering machines, which I I know this sounds like we're talking about the (laughs) 1860s somehow instead of the 1980s, but people actually were difficult to connect with. Now we're all so connected, it's perhaps not always a good thing. Now you can get somebody. If we need to talk to Kristen Dilley, we can reach Kristen Dilley. Pretty much. Most times. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you know, unless she's teaching or in a class or something like that. You know, you've got this device that we're all carrying around with us and this electronic tether. And that was Mm -hmm. totally not the case. Oh, no. Did you go with Bob when he went to Virginia initially? I did not. You know, with two small children, I felt, and, and, you know, Bob was very adamant that that was something that he needed to do. Several of our our friends offered to accompany him for support. He needed to do this by himself. So I stayed back in in Georgia with the children. My older brother Richard was summoned from Hawaii, where he was stationed with the United States Navy, and they had two little kids as well, my nephews. He flew back on a red eye and got back mm-hmm. as quickly as he possibly could. And they, then they both had the unenviable task of at least the initial interaction with law enforcement and the coroner's office. Right. Was Bob able to explain to you a little bit about you know, what he was getting for feedback or information then? He shared a bit what they knew, basic facts, I knew in my heart there was more that he did not wish to share. You know, you just, he was, he was like a dog, you know, holding on tight to a bone. You just wanted more answers. And knowing that time is against you, the longer this, this goes on. He shared what he knew, but it was, it was clear that it wasn't a lot. His, his comment to me was that it appeared that whoever did this, perhaps was someone in law enforcement or someone who was impersonating a law enforcement officer because the wallets were out, you know, as if you were pulled over, you know, license and registration, please. And, and, and so we were given the thought if it was either one person or two people. And you just wondered how one person could possibly have done this crime, you know, with two very strong, capable women. So that, you know, I think we both thought there had to have been a second person involved. You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. 
Many of you know that Authram is leading the way in DNA testing, helping law enforcement solve missing persons, homicides, and sexual assault cases across the United States and Canada using forensic-grade DNA tests. You can help this important cause by contributing funds and your DNA profile to Authram's free site, dnasolves.com. The process is easy and confidential. Just two simple steps. Now DNA Solves has added another new feature, DNA Solves Connect, which will allow you to upload your DNA profile to help law enforcement, even if you've never used one of the commercial genealogy sites. If you're looking for a missing family member or have lost touch with someone, DNA Solves Connect is an incredible option at only $14.95. Upload your DNA profile to dnasolves.com. Join Mind Over Murder as we help families find answers with Authram and dnasolves.com. We're back here at Mind Over Murder. I know one of the things I asked the FBI a few days later when they came up to meet with my parents up in Lowell, Massachusetts at our family home, they said, we believe your sister and Ms. Dowski were approached by an authority figure. And I stopped them and I said, we're sorry, we don't understand. What's an authority figure? And I was very struck by this. FBI agents, in my experience, are pretty polished they are in command of the facts. They are kind of on, on top of their game. It mm-hmm. was very evident they were extremely uncomfortable. And there's this long pause. And they said, well, what we mean by authority figure is law enforcement or someone mm-hmm. presenting as such. I know one of the sort of myths in the Colonial Parkway murders that's been created is that This developed over time, this idea of potentially of a law enforcement officer or someone presenting as such. Your recollection is the same as ours, which is the FBI said that from the very beginning of the case. In other words, we're a year before there's been any other incidents. And we're just talking about Becky and Kathy here. They were talking about law enforcement right from the very beginning. Had anyone ever mentioned, and I don't think we've talked about this too terribly much in the podcast, but we know that Becky did have an ex-boyfriend. Did anyone ever bring up the idea that he might have been involved to you, or was it always law enforcement from the beginning? I, initially, we thought it was the jealous boyfriend. Oh, okay. Um, I, that was our first thought in that. He was from a, a very strict from what we were told, you know, Middle Eastern country where, you know, this kind of thing would have, would have just put people over the edge and that did not happen. And as a front to his masculinity that, you know, we thought, well, my gosh, I could see the rage happening there. I would have to say that that was the first thought for us, not so much for, oh, he's going to react that way. It was the comment that, I don't know if it was one of Becky's friends or, or if it was one of the siblings, Karen or Julie, who had said she had dated this person and she was fearful of him or, or just of, of his, the strong willed portion of his character. And, it, and it, you know, it was like, this is, this is ending. Had you heard about this boyfriend before the incident in which Becky lost her life or this is after 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 the murders after it's very interesting it makes perfect sense to me that uh, someone with a dating relationship and a history with one of the victims would come up as a possible suspect i've never Mm -hmm. been completely satisfied with the story that i've heard from the fbi which is that he was supposed to be in washington dc that weekend We believe Kathy and Becky died on a Thursday night. Kristen, what do you think the drive time is at night between William and Mary in Washington, D.C. with light traffic? Um, About two hours and 45 minutes, maybe. Thank you. This is something that doesn't really wash for me. It's only two hours and 45 minutes at night with light traffic. So it isn't like he was on the moon Mm -hmm. for, for the weekend, but he supposedly has... Uh, an alibi that takes him to Washington, D.C., but that's not very far away. Right. Not really. Did you ever feel like he was 
uh, appropriately vetted in terms of the investigation or did you have any sense of that? I really did not have any sense of that. Um, you know, and, and I'm just going by what, you know, Bob shared. We were told, as far as I know, you know, the information they, they felt we needed to hear. Yeah. Was it everything that we wanted or needed to hear or was the truth? I don't know. Well, it's 35 years later and I still can't get yeah. a straight answer to my questions. Yeah. Do you recall how long Bob stayed in Virginia? It seems to me he was there for several days. He, yeah, he was there for at least, at least a day and a half, perhaps two days before he flew home. I recall he did radio and television and print interviews at the time. Would that have been in those first few days or would those have been a little later? Oh, I am not sure. There was such a incredible shock factor of just having to identify your baby sister and, and just the reality that, that this occurred and, and trying to talk to the appropriate people to gather as much information as you could. I know he spoke to a number of people, but whether he spoke to media at that time, I don't recall. Well, I've seen and read interviews with him oh. and I wasn't sure if they were done, you know, in that, initial period or if he might have come back to Virginia because again you couldn't do interviews remotely for the most part you had to right. be there and so I remember seeing him on camera at the time I, mm -hmm. I hadn't met him at that point um, and I've, I've gone back and as has Kristen we've watched and and read interviews with him but I think he would have had to have been there in the Williamsburg area in order to do those interviews right do you have any right. recollection of him returning to Virginia? He may have. It, it just, it is a blur of pain. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and returning back for the, you know, to go to that memorial service that they had at the, at the school and um, feeling um, on display. Media mm -hmm. was all over the place and, and the desire to, protect your children and you didn't want them shown and, and you just felt so exposed and raw. The whole thing was surreal. And then right after that, we traveled to New York for her memorial service with the family. And that was up in Poughkeepsie where the family was from. Yep. Where were her parents living at the time of the murder? Were they in Poughkeepsie or elsewhere? Bob's mom was in Poughkeepsie at the family home I believe her dad, I believe Julian was, I want to say he was, he was in Paris. They he were, stayed. And I'm, I'm, he spent some time in New York, but I think that was after the fact. So I think when he found out what had happened, he was in Paris and he flew back by himself. And they were divorced. Uh, her parents were divorced by that point. Yeah. Yeah. Now in our family, my father ended up being the person that interfaced with the FBI the most frequently, by far. Mm -hmm. In the Dowski family, it sounds like Bob might have taken that lead in terms of interacting with law enforcement. He did. Did you recall him then talking to law enforcement or would he do that from the office or? I think he, he there were several times he would talk to, to people from the home, but I think more often than not, it was, was from the office. I think there's an effort made, I've certainly done this in recent years, to shield the rest of the family from mm -hmm. those conversations, which can be extremely upsetting, as we all know. We just passed the 35-year mark here a couple of days ago. What are your thoughts and feelings about how the case has been handled, and how do you feel about the potential of this case being solved? That's a powerful one. I was just looking back on pictures of Becky and, you know, this life that was cut short much too quickly and that she was forever 21. She never got to meet her, her nieces and nephews and the generations that have followed. It is becoming increasingly clear to me that as a cold case, that this has been placed on the bottom of the heap, that there has been evidence that has been lost there has been evidence that has been shared inappropriately with people. 
that appalls me. In my heart of hearts, I pray that this will be solved. I don't see how this person can live with themselves. I honestly, you know, pray that God is heaping a pile of burning coals on their head, you know, of guilt. How can you continue to live your life when you have murdered all of these people? And certainly Becky and Kathy. You know, I pray it will be solved. It breaks my heart that Bob's mom never knew what happened. I would love it if, if this were solved before Becky's dad passes. You know, he's, he's still alert and, and spry and, and at 93. But I know that it continues to break his heart that he was never able to resolve things with his daughter because there were, you know, relationship things that occur over time that you, you, never, you never had the ability to, to connect and talk and say, I'm sorry. Yeah, we found many of the same things. There was, there was conflict and there were things that we had hoped would be resolved. And, and then suddenly the book is closed and you're not able to rectify those mm-hmm. situations. And that has been very troubling for members of our family as well. Her mother's been gone now for a number of years. Yes. Mm-hmm. Does Becky come up? You know, I know you're, you're going to have a family get together soon and that sounded like a very joyous and positive occasion and your kids and now you have grandchildren which is a wonderful time of Mm -hmm. life for you and tom your current husband is there a way to integrate becky into those conversations or is it something that's avoided i I think becky is never forgotten um especially you know this time of year Uh, my daughter's birthday is next week. Her death and service overlap during that time. And when you're a six-year-old, all you're thinking about is, it's my birthday next week. Aren't you excited? (laughs) As you should be. (laughs) Yeah. So that, you know, always kind of, I I know for my daughter, you know, it it still tugs at her heart that, you know, as she's celebrating her birthday, She's remembering, you know, that her Aunt Becky is not going to be there. Will Becky's name come up? Yes, it will. You know, I'm, I'm pleased that over time, you know, Bob and I can, can be in the same place and space with our children that, and that, it's, that it is a, a time of, re- of reconnection. And I'm hoping that there's going to be an opportunity. And I know it, it is horribly painful for him, but to be able to, you know, to talk about Becky. Because she's never forgotten. So you all have a family kind of reunion thing coming up. It family family vacation. So it'll it'll be certainly a booming group. <laughs> I think it'll, I recall you said there good. were sixteen people who are going to be here for this thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Family and friends, and you know, you you seize the moment. I think is is how everyone is 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 feeling. You know, given having lived live life with COVID the last year, but oh my you know, gosh, yes, creating memories always has been my mantra. You know, you can accumulate the wealth of the world, but you know, and then, you know, what do you get to do with it? It mm-hmm. is making memories that matters with the people you love, and you can't take it with you. You know, in other oh, words, you yeah. can have all the. <laughs> Um, no. money, money in the bank or a fancy car in your garage or whatever. And none of that really matters. You can take the memories with you though, which, and I, I love you for that. Is this the second time now you guys have all gotten together with this very large extended yes. family? And this will yeah. include your children and you are also a, a grandparent, are you not? Oh, yes. Yeah. My daughter has four and my son has two. My son is not going to be able to be there. You know, you grab grab who's there and, and you seize the day and seize the moment. And you have an adorable puppy who yes. I have loved seeing pictures of. So he's I'm sure right, he'll go to right at my feet. Well, sadly he can't come to this house cause this is too, it's, it's too foofy in his house. So he's <laughs> staying with my, my sister and, and her husband are going to come and be with the Cooper man and he'll have a good time. 
I know when we were talking last night, Jenny, Cooper was incredibly un- unhappy because he wasn't with you. And now we're having a chance to record this podcast. Cooper's at your feet and he's yes. perfectly happy as long as he's with his mom. Yep. Sound asleep on my feet. Oh, <laughs> he's a good boy. Well, Ziggy, Kristen's cat, is an yep. often an active participant of our podcast, but he doesn't make a lot of noise. <laughs> Well, did you hear him meow a minute ago? (laughs) I didn't catch that. He did. He's unhappy with me right now. I know this is really challenging to talk about, and we appreciate your willingness to come on and and talk about the beautiful, loving person that Becky was. I I know this is difficult, and, you know, we just can't thank you enough for it. It is is my joy. And, you know, as I said earlier, I just feel it's so important. Someone needs to speak for Becky. She's never been forgotten by anybody. And if I'm the only one that's going to speak, I'll scream. But I won't. She has never been forgotten and never will be. Well, we appreciate your eloquence. (laughs) All right, you two. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Jenny got me going. (laughs) It's all right. It's all right. Jenny, is there anything else you wanted to add uh, or, or a question that we didn't ask? You know, I think given the things that we can chat about, I mean, we talked about a lot last night that certainly gave me food for thought and not a great night's sleep, you know, but I just continue to to just pray that this is going to be solved. I mean, this person, how can they live with themselves? How can your heart be so hardened and so cold? I don't get it. I don't either. No easy answers. But I, you know, I think you, you have, um, you know, shared and I have tried to share, you know, my best memories of this precious, precious little girl who grew into this amazing young woman. And you just feel like you were robbed of time of her life in I, getting to, to know her as the woman that she could have been. And she was robbed of creating memories with this family and, and my kids and, and her brother's children and, it's just uh, unbelievable. I was thinking about the fact, listening to you speak a moment ago, Becky would be 56 years old now. And Can't imagine her being 56. Well, you know? and she would she's have lived this am- yeah. amazing life. And as you said, she's kind of frozen in amber at, always at age 21. But it's hard for me not to dwell on the fantastic, interesting, wonderful life that would have ensued from that senior yeah. at William and Mary going on to probably to grad school and working in business and I'm sure excelling in whatever she did, as well as being mm-hmm. the, the wonderful, caring person that she was. I've heard so much about her as a, as a sister, as a daughter, as a, a person that was absolutely wonderful with children and young people. Uh, Emily Pease, who was one of her professors. um, And I did call her and we spoke. I I don't know if we spoke or we emailed, but, you know, just what a lovely lady and and how impactful Becky's presence meant to her. She and her husband, Ed, used to go out to dinner with her and then she would also babysit their children. And they said she was just amazing with the kids. And yeah. They're incredibly fond of, of Becky, even though they only knew her for a couple of years during the time that she was there at William and Mary. Professor Pease was teaching English at that time and just took such a shine to Becky. It's always wonderful to hear you know, the, their stories and stories from other friends and family because, unfortunately, we never had the opportunity to meet Becky. The mm-hmm. Thomases had not yet met her. And, of course, our listeners won't have that opportunity either. So having you talk about her is really a wonderful way to keep her memory alive. My joy, my joy to share. Thank you so much for joining us, Jenny. We really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone for listening to this episode of Mind Over Murder. We'll see you next time. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. 
Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder. <laughs>